Well, ladies and gentlemen, I must start with an apology that in spite of this promising looking screen here, I have just one slide to show you, which is, and that's a map. Moreover, after this generous introduction, um, I will also start with, with a warning. In the slightly controversial words of Dorothy Sayers, who wrote, what we make is more important than what we are, particularly if making is our profession. People are always imagining that if they can only get hold of the writer himself and, so to speak, shake him long enough and hard enough, something illuminating and exciting will drop out of him. (laughs) But it doesn't. (laughs) Or in the terser words of Margaret Atwood, if you like Patty, don't bother meeting the duck. Well, fortunately, my subject this evening, which is surpassingly the greatest and most influential trade route in history, is, I hope, exciting enough on its own. Starting in eastern China and ending at the Mediterranean, the Silk Road is probably best seen less as a single route than a whole series of arteries and veins splitting and converging across the breadth of Asia for one quarter the length of the equator. It began officially, at least, in the second century BC, but was clearly at work uh, long before that. And there were times, uh, for instance, when the Roman Empire was echoed in the east by the great Han Empire in China, or when the Tang Dynasty, which is at its height in China in in the 7th century, that the Silk Road um, was clamorous with trade. In those days the camel trains went out, sometimes as many as a thousand strong, carrying not just silk, but out of China, iron and bronze work, lacquer work, ceramics, and a a, a sort of humbler trade in, for instance, the first first oranges and apricots, uh, rhubarb, mulberries, together with um, so many of the flowers that we're familiar with, the original chrysanthemums and roses, azaleas, peonies. And going back the other way, um, from the west went artefacts in glass and gold and silver, uh, woolen and linen fabrics, sometimes slaves, and um, a whole mass of goods out of, uh, out of Central Asia, um, innovative uh, plants and herbs, the vine, dates, the fig tree. <coughs> and a mass else. Probably there was nothing in the known civilized world that did not at one stage or another uh, cross uh, on that extraordinary silk road um, from rhinoceros horn to amber and frankincense, uh, rhubarb, dwarfs, ostriches, um, even a caged lion or two. Well, this invisible river was never traveled by, or virtually never, by just one individual. People went passing the goods from hand to hand in a kind of exotic relay race, so that the further the merchandise travelled from its origins, the more, uh, the more expensive it became, and the more it accrued a certain kind of magic. And its reach was astonishing. Silk has possibly turned up in the hair of a 10th century BC Egyptian mummy. It lies for sure in the graves of Iron Age Germany, this Chinese silk, and in the tombs of Bactrian Afghanistan from about 1500 BC. Going the other way, the western deserts of China had turned up, have turned up engraved seals, seals engraved with the images of Zeus and Pallas Athene. A 2,000-year-old mandarin corpse lies buried in a shroud woven with Greco-Roman cherubs. Mummies from the second millennium BC BC have been uncovered whose plaids echo those of early Celts. And in the Tang dynasty, we find the corpses sometimes buried where their mouths stopped with gold Byzantine coins, coins which, in the court of the time, were often used also as jewellery, sometimes inscribed with the images of Christian kingship. The Chinese discovered in silk an astonishing tensile strength. 
if everything else often has decayed in these ancient graves along the Silk Road, it is silk, astonishingly, that has remained, sometimes worn to a kind of colourless sliver, um, but often with the colours still amazingly vibrant. The Chinese knew the strength of silk, which they used even for fishing lines and for lute strings. Even now, if you were to lay two cables side by side, one of silk and the other of steel, it is the silk one that will be the stronger. Out of that tiny little silkworm cocoon, this, the thread can be unraveled, sometimes for over a mile, and you might say that that very delicate and yet strong thread is a metaphor for the silk road itself. This was a, an apparently rough and ready route, changing all the time, but an event only ha happened to happen on one part of it for the results to tremble along the whole length of it, so that, for instance, the pressure of pastoral tribes on the edge of the China Sea might unleash the Huns over Europe. A disaster cannot happen in Asia, wrote Cicero, without the Roman economy being shaken to its foundations. We have a map, please. Well, here, here is a, a map of my own journey along um, my version, as it were, of the Silk Road. And um, I went 7,000 7, miles by truck a lot, by local bus, hitchhike, only occasionally, I'm sorry to the romantics among you, by camel. And starting here in Xi'an, which is the first capital of a unified China where the terracotta warriors are, in the Tang period, undoubtedly the greatest city in the world, with a population of two million enclosed in 22 miles of walls. And up here, for what they call the Gansu Corridor to Jiaguan there, which was the, um, in many, time, many periods of Chinese history, was the exit through the Great Wall into the barbarism beyond. This was called the mouth of China. Um, if you were within the mouth, you were in the celestial kingdom, you were within civilization, outside where the silk went was barbarism. I came to Dunhuang there, which I expect several of you know, um, the great shrine, Buddhist shrine city on the edge of the desert. And from there, wanted to go along the southern silk road there, um, which the Chinese are not very fond of you doing. It's like the back road to Tibet. I was um, turfed off the bus I got on by plain clothes police, but got on another one going in the same direction, and nobody seemed to notice. And I eventually landed up there on the edge of the Taklamakan Desert. And here I passed through one of those um, boundaries, one of those borders, which are typical of this whole route. Um, although I'm... This is probably some 1,500 miles within the borders of China. You've crossed the border into a, to a completely different people, the Turkic Uyghur people, whose homeland this is, um, who are Muslim. The Taklubakan here is, I suppose, uh, perhaps the desert, the, the deadest and one of the most dangerous deserts on Earth. Unlike the Sahara, nothing grows in its heart. And... And even Marco Polo remarked how it was filled with strange noises and demons that led travellers astray because shifting temperature changes often cause, cause the dunes to rearrange themselves with strange noises. Taklamakan, rather discouragingly in the local dialect, means you go in but you never come out. <laughs> <laughs> Up here to Kashka the um, listening post of the great game, finally um, got into Kyrgyzstan there, a complete change of, of geography, high mountains, the Tian Shan and the Pamirs, through passes which the early Chinese traders um, who were prey to altitude sickness called the big headache and small headache passes. And you, Kyrgyzstan, which was one of those stands, one of those five republics of Central Asia, which sort of dropped off the bottom of the Soviet Union when it disintegrated in 1991, 
Um, uniquely, uh, the Kyrgyz kicked out their old ex-communist rulers and voted in a physicist as president. And for a while, Kyrgyzstan was a little sort of democratic Switzerland sitting there in the middle of Central Asia. Then I went down here where another um, hopelessly inaccurate border separates Uzbekistan from Kyrgyzstan. These are the borders um, of a peoples who are hopelessly interfused, um, borders created by Stalin in, in the mid-1920s. And eventually, to Samarkand there, where you can still see the grave of Tamerlane, the last of the great Mongol conquerors who died in 1405. It's a little bit like uh, being allowed to look at the grave of Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun, and yet it is uh, unaccountably beautiful. Oh, I went on to Bukhara, and there, from there I wanted to go south into northern Afghanistan. I was rather pleased with myself because I got permission from the Uzbek government uh, to, to go over the normally forbidden Oxus River into north Afghanistan. But I popped in, just before going, literally the day before going, I popped into the BBC offices in Tashkent to see how dangerous the land was ahead. And literally, the day that I had planned to go, war had broken out. Um, this is in 2003, war between two warlords, um, Admiral Rashid Dostum of Northern Alliance Notoriety and his rival Muhammad Atta, uh, needless to say not the 9-11 Muhammad Atta, but a Tajik warlord. And they had uh, broken out into, into fighting literally along the precise towns and tracks at which I planned to go. Um, in fact, um, as I was going in, the BBC had tracked down Dostum with a kind of field telephone and were interviewing him, trying to find out how long his war was going to last. And, and, he, and he said, well, General Arthur is not proving very amenable to our peace negotiations. You could hear the gunfire in the background. <laughs> A couple of hours later, they got hold of Muhammad Atta, who said, well, General Dostum, I, we, we feel our peace negotiations need a little bit of fine-tuning. And in, in the background, <laughs> um, within a couple of days, the part of Afghanistan I wanted to go to was covered in Russian tanks and, and corpses, and I had to delay. And rather pedantically, went back at precisely the same time the next year, in 2004, and managed to cross this border here, um, in, into what is now um, a, a, a part of Afghanistan that is, or was then, a little bit safer than the south. If I can see where we're going, it's more or less there. Um, there's Kobol, there's Mazar Sharif, and I was just going over the Oxus River there, which... Um, it is an extraordinary experience because the Uzbek border is probably the most fortified on earth. They've been um, terrified of the anarchy to the south for the last 30 years. But you go over the border not knowing, quite knowing what you do. You go over the Friendship Bridge um, built by the Russians into northern Afghanistan. And you're met by really nobody, just a couple of lounging Afghan soldiers with carnations sticking out of their rifle butts. And um, they say, welcome to Afghanistan. And you somehow... <laughs> You somehow get to Mazar Sharif, you saw hitchhike. And I have to say, as so many tra travelers have, that so there's a sort of lifting of the heart as you go into Afghanistan, in spite of everything. And there's an extraordinary different light, different air. Um, this is a people, one's aware, who have never been conquered. Um, as Robert Barland said in the 1930s, here at last is Asia without any inferiority complex. The, um, and I must say, in spite of uh, four and a half million people displaced and a million dead, um, this is a people you pity at your peril. I wanted to get across North Afghanistan there um, and finally found a Tajik with a Land Rover who was prepared to take me. I went to the local militia headquarters to find out the safety of the road ahead and they said we had to take two bodyguards but when I saw the local militia bodyguards, I thought it was safer to go without. <laughs> and we, so we, we sneaked out of Mazar Sharif before dawn and went, went across a road, um, a road littered with Russian tanks, uh, the remains of Russian tanks, and across the Dashti Leni Desert, picked up an old man who guided across that um, rather bitter desert. I expect some of you remember that when the 
um, when the Taliban in, uh, surrendered at Kunduz uh, to the Northern Alliance forces, the native Taliban forces were allowed to go home, uh, the, the Taliban, uh, Afghan Taliban. But those who were fallen, the Pakistanis, the Saudis, the Uyghur, the Chechens, were rounded up and put into uh, container lorries and were driven off um, to the Dashti Lady Desert there. There, those who hadn't suffocated to death were executed and buried. The United Nations has asked for permission to, to inspect that site, but has not been afforded military protection and has been unable to do so. We passed it fast and gingerly. The old man, who was the guide, said that he had seen hands and feet sticking out of the sands. Eventually, we got to this little place called Maimana there, and there the driver refused to take me any further. Um, already it was a couple of weeks since I'd seen another foreigner, and the, um, uh, the last aid workers had, had disappeared from the areas to the west. Uh, they were the Médecins Sans Frontières people who had been murdered a, a couple of months before. So I was stuck, and um, couldn't go any further, but fortunately there was a little landing strip in my manor, which was host to old, um, old Russian aircraft bringing in refugees um, out, of, out of Pakistan, mainly returning Afghan refugees. So I found myself at last boarding an aeroplane which was full of these marvellous looking people. The women, um, sadly, completely occluded in their burqas. Um, the men um, seemed enormous in their robes, vast beards and huge turbans. We looked like a complete plain load of terrorists. Um, and of course I was the only one who looked different in my faded anorak and crumpled trousers and they all looked at me most suspiciously as if I was going to blow them up <laughs> eventually however to Herat um, which is one of the or was one of the great cities of the medieval Asian world um, which is now in western Afghanistan and there and Again, in the aeroplane this time, I found myself crossing over that area there, where yet another of the um, unacknowledged uh, divides of Asia takes place, with no political boundary on the map. This one, that between the Turkic and the Persian-speaking worlds, one of, the, one of the deep and meaningful divides in Asia, which has no marker. Just as here, um, on, the, on the border, where the great Oxus River is, the Amu Daria, um, you would expect that magisterial river to be a great political and national divide, but it's not at all. Ethnically, it's almost meaningless. There are Tajiks and Uzbeks to the north, Tajiks and Uzbeks to the south. From Herat, which was in its day bigger even than Paris, which was the greatest city of medieval Europe, um, went into Iran to Mashhad, this great, um, this great shrine city of the Shia, where, by luck, I arrived at the festival of the 12th Imam, the great occluded Imam of the Shia. Thousands and thousands of people come to attend this ceremony, very moving and extraordinary. Across here, this part of um, northern Iran, uh, past Nishapur, where Omar Khayyam is buried, and that area called Khalasan, which seems still not to have quite recovered from the Mongol devastations of the 13th, 14th centuries, a desolate area, finally came to the little city of Rai, which has been complete, that was the Silk Road city of an earlier time, completely subsumed now in the southern suburbs of Tehran, which I think still has a reputation as being the fourth or fifth most polluted city in the world. And at last, over through the country of the assassins there, inaccurately thought to be the ancestors of the modern Islamic suicide bombers, um, a, a schismatic Shia sect. And to hear through Tabriz, another of these divides there, where you find that people are no longer Farsi-speaking, their first language is Turkic, they are Azeri. Uh, one quarter of the Iranians are not the Persian, as it were, at all, um, they are Turkic. And finally, to hear Rumye, um, this vast salt lake which flows almost to the Turkish border, the largest lake in Iran by a long way, but uh, amazingly shallow. It's only about 30 feet over its entire enormous stretch and um, is 
so salinated that it's home to just a few, um, very, uh, very, um, very few crustaceans, species of crustaceans and sea worms. That entire vast expanse is home to just a very few, very primitive forms of life. A bit like a political party mm-hmm. conference, I suppose. <laughs> um, and here you think at last there will be a border. This is the border between Iran and Turkey. And you think here is surely a political border that means something. But no, um, there are no or very few Turks or, or Iranians to be seen. Uh, it's Kurdish, Kurds to either side. And suddenly I found myself surrounded by Kurds. Um, the first people, I have to say, to express any delight at the US-led invasion of Iraq because, of course, they have a country, a de facto country in North Iraq. And the guerrillas, in, the Kurdish guerrillas within the Turkish borders were up in arms again. But I found a slightly mad Kurdish youth to drive me along the Iraq border there in the north, eventually um, a, a, along the Syrian border too, to Antarctica, where the Silk Road in the ancient period ended. Antarctica now um, a little modest Turkish town, which is the site of ancient Antioch. And just beyond that, the little port of um, Seleucia Peria. This is a port um, which is simply an abandoned acropolis, nobody there at all, a silted harbour over the sea from which Paul, St Paul, went on his first missionary journey and the silk took its final way westward over the Mediterranean. We can have the map up now, I think. Well, you might wonder in what frame of mind somebody undertakes a journey like that. And a lot of, um, there's a lot of romanticizing of travel writers. But in fact, um, you're going, of course, for the physical and sensuous as well as um, intellectual experience of a country. Uh, you're going, like a journalist in many ways, for copy. And so you push yourself that extra bit further. You do those things which you wouldn't do normally if you were just journeying for experience, uh, or I mean mean for ordinary pleasure, um, or simply for knowledge. So you're always pushing at the borders of the possible, feeling that whenever you you funk something, whenever you retract from something, you're slightly betraying some facet of the country which should have been exposed to you. So you find yourself daring that extra bit. And what you fear is not that something bad is going to happen, but that nothing is going to happen at all. Um, It's almost as if there are two of you going. You know, there's the one who's travelling, and there's the one who's going to write about it, who's sort of sitting on his shoulder watching. And just as the one who's travelling is getting, you know, shot at and mugged, uh, the one who's sitting on his shoulders, jumping up and down, saying, this is good copy, we can use this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can understand how war correspondents get shot, effectively, because they are seeing everything through that little rectangle, and you begin to feel that, to some extent, you, as a vulnerable entity, do not really exist. Um, you're a little bit separated from your own journey. And that, obviously, can, can be dangerous. I... Um, at any rate, have found that uh, travelling in this way has made me do things which I, I simply wouldn't dream of doing um, if, if I was going even for, on a fairly serious journey of research, um, let, let alone for holiday. All this sounds a little bit like um, those journeys that the early Victorians took or that, and the later Victorians too in terms of a sort of self-confidence Uh, which to some extent I'm a little ashamed of. And I do think that it's partly attributed to the system of the British boarding school. This conditions you um, to to a certain amount of um, uh, uh, self-sufficiency as well as misery. And and you, you... I mean, many is the old Victorian explorer who, after emerging from being bullied and shot at and starved in some distant part of Asia or Africa... Would, would emerge only to say that it was nothing compared to Eton. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite among these, and this is a, a, a cul-de-sac, 
is a chap called John Foster Fraser, forgive me anybody who's heard of him before, who simply took off uh, the typical Victorian in, in 1897, I think, with two indistinguishable chums called Lun and Low to bicycle 20,000 miles around the world and treated the whole thing as a sort of undergraduate prank. Um, described everybody between Romania and the China Sea as equal in savage repulsiveness. And um, they, they repelled the party marauding Cossacks by waving their British passports at them. And it, it, and it was only when, he was, when Fraser was stranded uh, on the Silk Road in the Elbers Mountains in waist-deep snow, abandoned by his guide, and was being eyed by three or four Persian bears rather gastronomically, that he, he did concede, we were not in a cheerful mood. <laughs> <laughs> they then whisk across India and into Burma, where the British, I think, had just deposed King Tibble, a very despotic monarch, Fraser said, he played cricket but would only bat. <laughs> and, and it's as they're going across, uh, across uh, the United States that uh, the classic um, encounter takes place. A Chicago barber comes out and says, where have you guys come from? And he says, in Delhi. And the barber says, fantastic, tell us the stories. You must have had amazing things to tell us. And Fraser says, no, no, we've had no adventures. You see, we're Britishers. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, there have been no perilous incidents. If we were Americans, we'd probably tell you yarns that will put your hair into ringlets. But no, no. That's the disadvantage of our birth, you know. <laughs> well, in a belated attempt to counteract some of this um, isolation and indeed um, legacy of superiority, I have attempted to learn the languages of the countries through which I've been, which has meant a, a lifelong battle, mostly a losing one, with Mandarin, Chinese and Russian Chinese, of course, Mandarin will take you across uh, northern China, although the dialects um, in the northwest, I have to say, completely defeated me. Russian is still the lingua franca of Central Asia among the older generation, and even, if you dare speak it, in parts of Afghanistan. But after that, I was on my own. Um, in western Afghanistan and Iran, um, I just simply had to resort to a, a terrible little Farsi phrase book, and... Um, I don't know how and what horrible mistakes I must have made. I, um, I've always, I, I do believe that um, even to learn a few phrases of a people's language um, shows that you have trouble to do so and feel their language worth, worth learning and that it makes a difference. But I think my attempts at Farsi were probably quite horrible and um, it did cross my mind that it might be better, in fact, uh, to know absolutely none of the language at all I was haunted rather by a, a journalist, Ionet Robinson, who was um, one of the crusaders after the Second World War for converting the then very superior British phrase books into something more polite and emollient. And um, this woman, I, I remember, um, coached a friend of hers who was travelling to Greece in just one or two words of Greek, which would make her more, more polite. In particular, the word "zimbelazi," which, uh, I suspect many of you know, means basically "it doesn't matter in the least." And this woman went around in many Greek situations saying, "It doesn't matter in the least." Um, it really worked quite well um, until, of course, Nemesis came on Easter morning when she was in a crowded village square and people were bumping into her and saying something, and she thought they were apologising for bumping into her. So she kept saying, "It doesn't matter in the least, zimbelazi." But as many of you know, I'm sure. Um, on Easter morning, the Greeks have a custom of greeting one another with the words, Christ has risen. <laughs> to be told it didn't matter in the least was not in here. <laughs> well, the Silk Road made possible the strangest mixings and miscegenations. Um, I was incarcerated momentarily for the SARS virus on the edge of the Taklamakan desert. And when I was prematurely let out, I went on to a salt flat, um, which was, had been the, uh, uh, an, an acropolis, basically, uh, for an early people. I found myself looking down into a grave pit where there were some 15 individuals assembled. So salinated is that area and so dry 
that these individuals had more or less been petrified into, into modern sculpture. And they weren't mongoloid, um, they were caucasoid with high bridge nose, noses, um, very tall. Uh, the people of this uh, area who had been dug up, some in better preservation than these. In the same area, um, a strange tomb had been discovered, I think by Chinese archaeologists, of what appears to have been a shamaness. In the cave ceiling, the, the tomb ceiling above her, a baby had been inserted with the mucus and tears still clear on its cheeks. And above him, a younger woman dismembered on blood-stained blood clothes. Chinese annals of the period uh, report the presence of a, of a barbarian, a pale barbarian people, um, who then fade away from their histories. And it seems that these mummies now are surfacing all over the Taklamakan Desert. Some are dressed in Celtic-looking tartans, and others in strange sort of narrow witches' hats. And they appear to have gone against the tide of that tide we're familiar with from east-west migration, and to have come from some area of eastern Europe via the Siberian steppes and descended that way into the Tarian Basin, into the Taklamakan area. There, years later, uh, centuries later, they intermingled with the Uyghur, the modern inhabitants of the area. And you still see among the Uyghur, quite eerily, um, these pale hazel eyes, pale blue or grey eyes, and this reddish crinkled hair. Well, the Uyghur, who have been frightened for a long time of being ethnically swamped by the native Chinese, have even adopted one of these mummies as their kind of national symbol. She lies in a, in a museum vitrine, um, a, a young woman um, who they call the beauty of Quran. And she is indeed still beautiful with a lovely bone structure, these long, delicate hands, long eyelashes. But you're looking at her in a museum casement and she's some 4,000 years old. And here's another strangeness. The worst disaster to befall the Roman arms um, took place in 53 BC when the Triumvir Crassus marched um, a, a legionary army of some 45,000 into the Syrian desert against the Persian Empire at the time, the Parthians. There they were virtually liquidated. 10,000 were captured and were marched off, it seems, to the eastern confines of the then Persian Empire. There they vanished from Western history. But Chinese annals at the time come up with a strange story of mercenaries who were fighting in the service of a local chief against the Chinese. And they locked their shields together. Now this is Crassus calling now. Um, <laughs> we have, <laughs> they locked their shields together in the sort of tortoise formation um, that we're familiar with from uh, uh, descriptions of the Roman legionaries, and the Chinese captured a number of them. At the same time, a little place called Lijian um, arises on the western Chinese frontier, Lijian loosely meaning um, uh, Roman Empire, or indicating Roman Empire at that time. The Chinese, rather like the Romans themselves, seem to have a habit, have a habit sometimes of naming settlements after those who they settled there. Well, this strange discovery um, of an Oxford professor provoked an archaeological excavation in 1993 and sure enough in the place that they thought of as Li Jian they turned up Roman era walls. At the same time the local press was suddenly full of stories that the local people around there were very tall, um, had fair hair and blue eyes and um, even, uh, even exercised some worship of Mithraic bulls like the Roman legionaries. So, of course, I had to go and examine this area called Yongchang in the Gansu Corridor, very remote. Finally got there and was astonished to see coming towards me after I had asked to see the tiny museum there. The museum clerk, who was called Song Wurong, they called him the Redhead locally. He was a long-faced, gangling man with European features, these very pale grey eyes, 
and crinkly kind of cinnamon-colored hair. He could speak nothing but a very uh, deep dialect uh, of Mandarin, which I couldn't understand at all. He had a friend called uh, Luo Ying, who looked like a North Italian. And Luo Ying said that there were many people like them in this area, and he owned a little three-wheeled cab, and he said he'd take me there. So for a couple of days, we went off in the area of Yongchang, hunting for Romans in China, as it were. <laughs> These Romans tended to dissipate around us as we went. Many of the ones who were most celebrated seemed to have either died or emigrated. But now and again, we would a door would be opened to us, and there would be one of these strange-looking people with a sort of European cast of countenance, again, this sort of crinkly red hair, and very often pale eyes, often hazel or grey, even occasionally blue. Well, for a while, I found this idea infinitely seductive, particularly since uh, a Beijing geneticist, I think, has recently been in the area and reported a, a great deal of Caucasoid blood, some perhaps 25% of people in that area having a, a kind of Caucasoid blood. But I think you could take such a test anywhere along the Silk Road, particularly in that area, and come up with just about the same sort of results. Certainly anywhere among the Uyghur you could. Um, because of the movement of Iranian tribes in particular, uh, for nomadism, for merchandise, um, it's an extraordinarily mixed area. And indeed, nobody has asked actually what the Roman legionaries of Crassus would have looked like. The modern Chinese rather assume they'd have looked like sort of Norwegian tourists, tall and blonde. <laughs> but in fact, they've been a rather motley crew, I think, of Sabines and Latins with a few Gaulish mercenaries thrown in, and not looking right at all. So my confidence um, quickly began to wane um, in this rather delightful fantasy of Romans in China. But Luo Ying wasn't having any of this. He was very bitter when I told him I didn't believe any of it. And he said, well, there's one man I know, and this will convince you. He's more European than you look, um, and I'm going to get you there. So we went to what I think was the poorest village I had seen in that area, to the poorest house in it. And there I was astonished to see a man with ash blonde hair, very pale, milky blue eyes, sitting in the courtyard. I took his hand in astonishment. We went indoors. He, um, he had an ancient mother. She seemed ancient to me. They were both prematurely aged. She, in fact, was younger than I was. And we went and sat in this uh, a, a absolutely spare house with a, a thatched roof, a reed of reeds and a beaten earth floor, and the only furniture, just a, a brick peasant bed, a kang. And um, I began to regret that we had gone, because this man um, had heard somehow that he must have European blood or perhaps Roman blood, and I think they thought that we in some way were going to be their ticket out of there. Once or twice, sitting beside him on the, on the kang, he said to me, won't you take me back to London with you? But I saw that the hand beside mine on the, this bed was oddly flaky and pink and remembered how this man had flinched in the sun and he was, of course, an albino. Well, it wasn't just peoples and material goods that travelled the Silk Road. It was, of course, inventions, religions and ideas. The 17th century English philosopher Francis Bacon um, said that there were three great inventions which had, in his day, transformed the contemporary world, printing the magnetic compass and gunpowder. All of them, of course, had come from China. But curious enough, in China itself, they never had the impact that they did in the West. Gunpowder, at first, wasn't used for warfare, but just for fireworks. The magnetic compass uh, wasn't employed for, at, at first for colonial exploration and conquest, but was used as a child's toy and for the sighting of tombs. Printing, instead of ushering in the great revolution that it did in the West, in China simply seems to have shored up the old system by the reproduction of ponderous genealogies and the entire Buddhist canon 
in 130,000 stone tablets. Yet you only have to stand by those terracotta warriors to see that China was not the sealed up nation that it supposed itself to be. The bronze metallurgy of the weapons that have decayed um, was refined in Central Asia. The chariots, which one sees there, decayed um, behind the drivers who are still intact. The chariots disintegrated in the dust. Those, the prototypes of those chariots had been crisscrossing the steppes of southern Russia and Mesopotamia for 2,000 years before they reached China. And, of course, the prototypes of those beautiful horses had all come along the Silk Road by tracks from the West. At the same time, there is very clearly there in the clay the outline of a crossbow, a Chinese invention which momentarily was to revolutionise warfare when it finally reached medieval Europe. And above all, the stirrup. The stirrup was a Chinese invention, the heavy stirrup at least, uh, probably from the 4th century AD. And it was this very simple, you would think, mechanism which stabilised uh, the armoured knight on his horse. The knight, of course, who was a linchpin of the feudal age. 700 years later, one finds that same feudal age in Europe coming to an end when castle after castle is being blown up by the Chinese invention of gunpowder. One could say fancifully, and it's only a fancy, that the birth and death of the Middle Ages came along the Silk Road from the East. Among all the borrowings and transfusions that I encountered along the Silk Road, um, of course, were many different versions of Islam. Islam, we think of as perhaps two monoliths now, think of too easily as the great Shia and Sunni monoliths. But of course, like Christianity, it is infinitely more complex than that. In the far northwest of China, for instance, there are people called the Hui, who are virtually indistinguishable from the Chinese themselves. They, probably, their ancestors, came along the Silk Road in the 7th, 8th centuries. Compare them, for instance, with those uh, extraordinary Shia pilgrims which I saw, probably tens of thousands of them in the Iranian shrine of Meshed where here's one of the great, the great schools of Islam the great sects of Islam, sects of Islam the Shia who are um, in a way still steeped in a feeling of, of long out of sacred history, mourning their imam there in, in, a, in a ceremony of extraordinarily moving and, and, and peaceful. Um, compare these again with Kyrgyzstan, where the Islam is very thin, came under the influence of Sufism in the 19th century. There, I found myself visiting a shrine, for instance, which had its imam, it had its mosque, but it was just the lightest glaze over a pagan past. When the imam took me around the shrine at night, it was two interlocked hills, he described how the warriors of an almost prehistoric period in Kyrgyz history, the warriors of the champion Manas, were buried under the hill. There was a place where the king of the serpents lived, and sacred serpents uh, dwelt under rocks there, which were rocks that would burst into flame and prayer. And so on. the whole thing was absolutely steeped in paganism. It was shortly afterwards that I was taken up by a couple of rather ruffianly Kyrgyz in a Land Rover to a high highland lake in the Tian Shan. And there um, I, was, I, I managed to get hold of a horse and, and escape, as I thought, and was contemplating the lake when the awful Land Rover came up behind me and the Kyrgyz came out of it and said um, uh, they had a shepherd with them trading a little lamb and various other men. They said they lined up facing the west, I remember, and they said, this is in your honour. And I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I said, are we facing Mecca? And I said, no, we were facing the pagan sunset. Then the shepherd drew a knife across the lamb's throat and I was given one of these feasts, which... Um, are almost indigestible because you eat the lamb within about half an hour of its being killed. People often ask me, incidentally, whether or, or whether I ever felt I was close to death on any of these um, excursions. 
And uh, the only time it happened was really quite banally um, by a, a, a near road accident because the, these two Kyrgyz villages uh, drove me back down the mountain in their Land Rover. And like most, sadly, of the Central Asian people, they're completely afflicted by the, um, the Russian legacy of vodka. And they've been drinking heavily without my noticing. And they both passed out, including the chap at the wheel. And we... <laughs> And we converged very slowly, late at night, on a vast lorry, about the only thing in the whole country, it seemed, coming towards us. I still don't know how we missed it. The next morning, the two Kyrgyz were so contrite that one of them just left the village. I never saw him again. And the other one went the other way and invited me home um, to, uh, in recompense. I, my heart sank because as I went into the courtyard, there was another enormous bowl of fresh blood with dogs lapping from it. Another lamb had been killed in my honour. Another feast took place. And he was in fact so contrite that he even off offered me his wife for the night. <laughs> I, I'm glad to say this was not Saudi Arabia, however, and she gave him a good clout. <laughs> well, as you stand before those terracotta warriors, you think of the man... Um, it's strange, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, who, the first emperor of a unified China, um, who gave his name to China. And he is buried there in a tomb which perhaps is still untouched, buried in a, in a vast chamber which reproduces the empire as the Chinese knew it during his lifetime. The landscape picked out in bronze, the cities in precious stones, and the firmament of the chamber above him um, spread with the Chinese constellations as they knew them, picked out in pearls. The emperor, meanwhile, is floating on a coffin on a river of quicksilver with his, with his slain wives beside him. And this man, the founder of the first unified China, who gave his name to China, turns out um, not to be Chinese at all. He was some kind of barbarian, uh, from the northwest. So, it seems, uh, if he existed, was the Yellow Emperor, the mythic progenitor of the Chinese people. Again, not Chinese, um, but it's hard to put an ethnic uh, name to such people, but a barbarian, again, from the northwest. And so, um, as I must gratefully point out, uh, Victor Meyer of the University of Pennsylvania has written, um, the, many of the emperors of a uni, the unifying emperors of China, not just the Yuan, but even the Tang, were very likely not Chinese at all, but were barbarian people uh, from the north or the northwest. Well, if a country as apparently sealed and defined as China, what are the Central Asian nations? These are astonishing infusions um, in which the people are almost impossible to separate from one another. Stalin tried to do so, mostly in 1926, uh, doctoring their histories, doctoring their languages even, and creating five countries where before was a much vaguer mass of, of Islamic peoples. Stalin, of course, was, this was not a benevolent act. He was simply frightened of a unified Islamic power facing the Slavic North in a newly formed Soviet Union. And so one finds in a world which uh, really um, predated all concepts of 19th century European nationalism, we find these artificial boundaries uh, and peoples who, uh, less than a century earlier, would never have defined themselves as Kazakhs or Kyrgyz or Uzbeks. They would have probably said, um, I am the member of this clan or that city or that region, or perhaps simply, I am a Muslim. Now, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, these countries were dragged almost um, hesitantly onto the, on, onto the stage of, of two nations. Even the Iranians, it seemed to me, were sometimes less conscious of their real history than of that half-legendary history, the Shahnama, um, which was created for them by their great poet, Fyodorzi. And as for the Kyrgyz, um, they have fallen back on the Manas, which is an extraordinary epic, probably the longest great epic in the world, I would say, longer than the Odyssey, the Iliad, and the Mahabharata combined. 
um, which goes back long pre-Islamic uh, to a time of a great mythic ancestor, uh, Manas. The Uzbeks um, have uh, co-opted, um, so many of these countries have looked back into history trying to find some sort of validation for themselves. The Uzbeks have co-opted Tamerlane, um, the great Mongol conqueror who died in 1405, as their sort of national hero. Um, but Tamerlane was a, a Turco-Mongol of the Bales clan, and uh, the Uzbeks uh, only arrived in the area where he was um, some century later. And yet there are academic encomiums to him, streets and squares are named after him. He's even invoked in front of the army and invoked for the war against terror. Um, he, the, one of the greatest terrorists the world's ever known. Um, but again, that hunting for some sort of legitimacy in the past um, is typical of these nations and finding it not in some sort of ethos or philosophy, but usually in an individual. As for the Kyrgyz Manas, um, they claim to have found his tomb, which has been turned into a national shrine. I came to this along the Talas River, close to the Kazakh border, and found indeed that it had been um, taken over in a loose way uh, under an Islamic cloak, and there were mullahs, there was praying around it. When you found the tomb, which was supposedly that of a, a pagan warrior uh, from perhaps 2,000 years before, it was clearly an Islamic tomb, it was empty. And over the grave, uh, over the arch to the grave, in Kufic script, was, a, uh, was a, uh, an inscription saying that this is the grave of the princess Kianesia Khatgun, who was the daughter of a 14th century Turkic emir. Well, to those who prayed here, to those who believe in it, such things don't matter. These heroes, in a way, swim in their own stream of time. And if the Silk Road has anything to tell me or us, it's perhaps this in the words of the French philosopher Ernest Renan. A nation is bound not by the real past, but by the stories it tells itself, by what it remembers and what it forgets. The end of the Silk Road came quite gradually, but probably in the middle of the 15th century, when Central Asia had broken up into warring Turkic and Mongol Khanates, and the Ming dynasty suddenly closed up the Great War, and in the most astonishing act of self-occlusion, demasted its entire heavy merchant fleet of 3,500 vessels and closed itself away. At the same time, the Portuguese in 1498 discovered the seaway around Africa, and bit by bit, as in some great sort of tectonic shift of the earth, the whole weight of the civilized world begins to transfer itself out of those Central Asian lands. Um, the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean in particular, even that falls silent uh, before the weight of the Atlantic seaboard and the emerging countries um, facing onto the Atlantic. In other words, the Silk Road um, really begins to disintegrate, to fragment about that time into shorter journeys, really. And the whole emphasis, um, the whole weight of, of trade and exploration begins to transfer itself westward to the New World, uh, to the great seafaring nations of Europe. If there was a, a moment of nemesis for the Silk Road then, I say I would think that it was not, say, the capture of Constantinople in 1453 or the closing of the Great War by the Ming, but was that moment when an unknown Chinese, sometime in the 10th century, discovered the maritime compass. Thank you very much for listening.